steadfast mercy still is certain as your wounds of love take me to that sacred tree for weary lords of shame
In Christ he has in heavenly realms His blessings on us for For pure and blameless in his sight He destined us to be And now we've been adopted through His Son eternally You are the God who saves. You are the God who saves. Come praise and glorify our God who gives His grace in Christ. In Him, all our sins have been washed away, redeemed through sacrifice. In Him, God has made all to us. That Christ should be the head of all His purpose to fulfill To the praise To the praise of Your glory To the praise of Your mercy and grace To the praise of Your glory Because You are the God who saves set us free from our sin So we call upon the name The only one who can save So come praise and glorify Come praise and glorify our God For we believe the world And through our faith we have Seal, the Spirit of the Lord is our assurance. The Spirit guarantees our hope until redemption's done. Until we join in endless praise to God the free and one. To the praise of your glory, to the praise of your mercy and grace. Praise of your glory, you are the God who still prays to the praise of your glory, to the praise of your mercy and grace, to the praise of your glory, you are the God who saves, you are the God who saves.
Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to welcome you back to the second of our evangelism seminars. Glad you could make it. Um, if you're joining us on live stream, you're also very welcome. If you're here with us yesterday, you know that we had a fantastic time looking at the principles of evangelism from 2 Corinthians 4 with Rico. And I'll see if I can remember them to make sure we've got it right. <laughs> but God's sovereignty, we've got to hold these principles together, God's sovereignty that God is doing the work. And what's the next one? Integrity. Integrity, we've got to tell the truth, and also our creativity, those three things holding together. And this morning, Rico's going to talk to us about what John Stock called our guilty silence. Those times when we as individuals or as a church have kept silent when we had the opportunity to speak about the Lord Jesus. And I'm sure Rico will tell us that through COVID and as our churches emerge from lockdown, we've got unique opportunities to speak about the Lord Jesus. So this is a very timely seminar as we think, how can we overcome these barriers that prevent us speaking about the Lord Jesus? So let's pray for ourselves. Let's pray for Rico now and dive into God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to be here together to think in these beautiful surroundings about spreading the gospel, sharing with other people the glories of our Lord Jesus Christ. Forgive us, Heavenly Father, for the times that we've kept silent. And speak to us today, we pray, through the power of your Holy Spirit, not just to convict us, but also to change and transform us so that we do speak to our friends, our colleagues, our community about your beautiful Son. Pray that you'd be with us, guide our discussions, help Rico as he speaks, help him to know your power and your presence and your authority. Be with us today, we pray for your name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all very much for coming again today. We're just going to do a little bit of a revision from yesterday and then go forward. Just to say, though, we thought yesterday about God's sovereignty, that God is the evangelist. He opens blind eyes. The results belong to him. And I went to get my hair cut yesterday. Thank you. I'm, you, I'm sure you think it looks great. But there was a Turkish barber. I walked in. We sat down. I said I was at the convention. He got out a John Blanchard book. This guy was Turkish in Turkish. 
that obviously someone had given to him at the convention. So if any of you men have done that, well done. I don't know who did it, but it was very impressive. So uh, that, that was great. What did we do yesterday, brothers and sisters? Do you remember what we did? We were giving, and here's the key word. Do you remember this word? We've got to do this if we're trying to run evangelism in our churches. We're giving people confidence. Confidence. That's absolutely essential. And as we give people confidence, we remember that the reason we're Christian is that we preach Christ. So that's 2 Corinthians 4 verse 5. But God opens blind eyes. The results belong to him, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6. And that's our methodology for um, uh, getting the gospel out. We preach Christ, God opens blind eyes. And then we thought about the fact that actually there are three great, or three great themes in evangelism. God's sovereignty, our integrity, it's there on page two of your uh, handout, and creativity, as Elizabeth said. It's always those three things that, 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 that the, we've got to pray because the results belong to God. We've got to tell the truth and we've got to be creative and throw energy into it. I wonder if you can just jot someone down on those three who can help you with those. Who's someone who can help you pray? There's an old lady, Ann Neller at All Souls, and uh, uh, she, she died uh, 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 recently, but my goodness me, she didn't, wasn't half an inspiration on prayer. Who's a prayer who will help you pray, particularly in your intercessions on evangelism? Secondly, who's someone who helps you tell the truth? Jot the name down. Who's somebody who, who actually, as you just look back, you think, gosh, that, that person makes sure I tell it and will ask me that. Do you know, my wife is like that with me. She looks as though butter wouldn't melt in her mouth. She's terrifying. I get back, and if I've not been clear in a sermon, I can hear this silence emanating. She says, darling, do you think you really were clear today? I think, well, I thought it was all right. I don't think you were, darling. You know, so, you know, I get quite a lot of unsolicited feedback on telling the truth. Thirdly, creativity. Who's great on energy? Who says, let's try this, let's do that. Let's put an event on. By the way, for an event, four Ps are the key for an event. When you're trying to put on an event, as people come back from COVID, what do we do? Number one, we pray. Lord God, please open blind eyes. Secondly, second P, prepare to fail. It's okay if it goes wrong. We're just going to have a go. Let's try something. You know, we'll, we'll open up a garden and someone can talk, we'll host people, someone can talk about gardening and we can ask them their story in the middle of it. Number thir third P, passion. Find someone who's passionate about an activity and then interview them about it. And then number four, preach Jesus. Let's say, look, we're Christian people. We're unashamed of him. We'd love you to look more. But those four Ps as we organize stuff. And do you remember yesterday I said... When it comes to uh, evangelism and preaching Christ, we have to do it at four levels. Do you remember I said from the front, in a small group, one-to-one, -one, and read the Bible for yourself at home. So with the Christianity Explored material, when people come on courses and they're non-Christians, we model that. They get a talk from the front, they have their own booklet, they, they study it in a small group. They get sent home to read something. And uh, 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 at home, uh, uh, um, sorry, yeah, yeah, they get sent home to read something, but also they discuss it with their leaders. And I'm saying yesterday that the silver bullet for the next 20 years is going to be one-to-one -one work. Now, what's difficult about this, brothers and sisters, is this. You weren't brought up with it. That's the problem. In our churches, we weren't really brought up, unless you were scripture union background or navigators, that one-to-one -one discipling didn't really happen. So now we're having to change the culture. Let me show you how. Do jot this diagram down <coughs> in terms of, um, you know, uh, going home with it. And it's on page three, page three of our little booklets here. And do you remember I said yesterday, we can't be Bible teachers we can be Bible sharers. And again, it was why I commended the word one-to-one, -one, and I gave you the handout of it, just walking through a section where you just read it. So you get the questions and the answers, you just read it through with someone, and let the word do its work. But why, why am I so keen on this? Let me just give you an outline here. This is a great thing to do as you get back to explain the relevance of this. So here we are. Uh, in 1954-55, what happened was, here was man, 
here's our sin, here's God, and Billy Graham comes to Haringey and preaches the cross. And it was amazing. Two million people went to Haringey. 40,000 were converted. 40,000. How many of those converted were already in church of the 40,000 converted? Anyone know? 90%. But it was amazing. I mean, I was a youth worker, in, 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 uh, a student worker in Bristol in the 80s. The number of students whose parents were converted or came to faith via Billy Graham. But, but that's how that happened. So, so people were already... <clears throat> when they were here, they, we were from a Christian culture. They'd already got, by the time they were here, they'd had, you know, Church of England primary school. They'd had Bible readings each morning. They'd done the Lord's Prayer. They'd been in churches. Billy Graham comes in and says, repent and believe. So that's where we were, 1954 Haringey. When I arrived at All Souls, 1994, so, so a long time later, by the way, I don't look as I've been there 30 years, but I have. And that's because my hair is good and I've sacrificed my body for my face. But anyway, there we are. So, so here we are, 1994. And there are four blocks in the way of people coming to faith. Christians are weird. So on the media, when they depict a Christian, they always depict an absolute nutcase, don't they? I mean, you know, at All Souls, we've had people who've been taken next door to the BBC. Time and again, we've got so many great people. They just take a nutcase because there's a certain story they're wanting to tell about Christians. Uh, secondly, uh, it's irrelevant, the Christian faith. So, it, you know, it's not on the basement, of, or not on the ground floor of real life. It's on the first floor of, well, you know, that's an option you've got. But it's not, it's not the real world. So it's, it's, it's irrelevant. Thirdly, it's untrue. That's the third thing, that's the third narrative we keep being told. You know, as, as we heard the other day, uh, last night, just, you know, 40% of people don't even think Jesus was a historical figure in this country. It's extraordinary that. They don't even know the historical roots of it. What does that say about our preaching at Christmas and Easter? Uh, but, but the next one is actually, uh, Christians are homophobic. There's another b battle there. We're not. We've all got gay friends that we like very much, but we are orthodox. By the way, if you look at Talking Jesus, which is this survey that was done two years ago, it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's, a, it's an amazing survey, actually, uh, this survey. One of the things it says is that if you talk to people who... 67% to of people in this country have got a Christian friend they like. That's what it says. 67%, two in three people have got a Christian friend they like. It was an amazing survey done. We got it repeated because we didn't believe it because the media would tell us it was 20%. But it's, it's two thirds of people and the reason they like Christians is they're selfless. So we did this survey twice. Uh, the, the people who did it, Barna, said it was 90%, 95% accurate because we didn't believe it. I gave my own personal money to help do it the second time round because it was so important that. So by the way, all of you, between, in here, there are thousands of friendships with non-Christians represented here and they like you because you're selfless. And I want to say to you, brother, sister, well done and keep going. Keep serving. People really appreciate Christians personally. Now, of those 67% who've got a Christian friend they like, what percentage of them think that Christian friend they like is homophobic? Answer, 6%. 6%. The normal person in the culture does not think you, because they know you are homophobic and they know you've got gay friends who like you and you like them and you celebrate them. Oh, we're orthodox, but we're liberal in the sense that we celebrate free speech and we just get on with being kind. So go on being kind and remember that the media may depict us as homophobic, but that is not what the person on the street thinks as they see us interact. There are four gay couples on my street. I hold the keys for, for one of them. We're friends. I mean, they call me the 18th century clergyman. We laugh, but we're friends and we try to be kind. Now... Uh, 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 these are the four blocks here, but it does take time to knock these over, get to here, see your sin, and then come on a course like uh, Alpha or Christian Explored. Often, you see, that was one evening, 1954. 1994, it often took two years, I reckon, to get people to the point whether they were ready to come on a Christian Explored course. And they needed it because when they were here and asked to repent in the, and believe in one evening... They'd had a lifetime of Christian background. But now, but by 1994, there was low-hanging fruit. But even then, people needed stuff inputted. But now, in terms of getting people on a course, here's the issue. P 
people are here and they're looking in that direction. This presumes they're heading towards faith, they're not. And this road that they're on is defined by two things, tolerance and permissiveness. Tolerance, I can think as I please. Permissiveness, I can do as I please. And it's absolutely godless. So what is the absolute key? Now, please jot this down. Here's the silver bullet. The absolute key to our evangelism is the individual who is a friend. That's the key. Now, if you go to Talking Jesus, now let me give you the website to look this up, everyone, www.talkingjesus.org. Again, this was done pre-COVID. It'll be much more than this now. This says, of the 67% of people nationally who've got a Christian friend they like, so they, what do they like? They're selfless. Of that 67%, 20%, one in five, would like to know more about Jesus if asked. Now, what does that work out at? Let me tell you, this is our mission field. That works out at 7.5 million people. 7.5 million people pre-COVID were saying, if someone said, would you like to look at 20 sentences of the Bible about Jesus? They would say yes. But what does that also mean? It means that 80% of people who like you still don't want to look at it. And they're your friends. Isn't that true? Is that not true? They like you, but they don't want to know more because John 3, they love darkness. They're just not ready to do it. So you've got to be prepared for rejection. They like you. They say, well, no, John's a good bloke. Do you want to look at the Bible? No. But, but, but one in five does want to know. And the trouble is, with my church family, and I love my church family, they're waiting for the one in five to come to them and say, would you look at the Bible with me? And they go, oh yes, I will, but it doesn't work that way. We have to cross a pain line, have 80% rejection, and then we never know who the one in five is who are gonna say, I'd like to know more. But they're there, and we don't know who they are, but we've gotta give them a chance to find out more. And, 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 and so what we try to do at All Souls is that we've got people trying to read one-to-one, -one, again, just doing Bible sharing, uh, 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 not Bible reading, just going through word one-to-one. -one. And then let's have the first slide, please. What are the, what, as we, uh, can we flick it up? That'd be great. Or have I, I've got it here. Here we go. What are the benefits of this one-to-one -one work? I wonder if just in pairs, you can go through that. So the benefits, there, there are six there, do you see? Understanding, application, example, confidentiality, training and flexibility, just in pairs or just on your own, just jot down what you think I mean by that. So when it comes to meeting individually with someone, why are those six areas so, uh, uh, so helpful to that? So I'm gonna get the Bible out individually. I'm gonna say, do you wanna have a look? How is it meeting individually with someone? Why are they all benefits? You've got a couple of minutes. Just jot them down if you can. That'd be great. What are the benefits of this one-to-one? 7.5 million people, if asked, would do it with you. And now, post-COVID, it's more than that.
Okay, everyone. And again, this will be a cultural change for our churches. And we've just got to keep doing it. What we've got to be convinced of is that it's the right thing. And may I say you can do all, what you can do is that, is that here is your church life and these are all the events we put on and all the welcoming and all of that. But if you don't have the one-to-one on terms of evangelism, bringing people along, it's going to get very difficult. <laughs> so so we, we, we've got, you know, we, it's very important. So when I used to give this talk 20 years ago, I'd say the most important thing is get evangelism in the diary. Spring, summer and autumn, have some events and a course in there, you know, a couple, a, a two or three events, some guest services and a course. I say if you do that, people will come along. I'm saying that's still important to get into your diary, your church diary, you know, Christmas and Easter, when are we doing our evangelism? Let's not have it as a bolt-on. Let's have it in the DNA of the church. But I'm now going, you can have all these things going on, lots of events, your spring, summer, and autumn, and you can have it all in the diary, but if you're not modelling it, and as me as a pastor, if I'm not modelling doing evangelism, it's much harder. Whilst it used to be, 20 years ago, that people would bring themselves along because they knew they should because they had a praying granny who was saying, when are you going to go to church? I mean, the number of people I read the Bible with. So I remember I, I read the Bible with a guy called John Webb who played, we played rugby together. He played fullback for England. So for a time we played together. He went and played for England. I went and played for Wooten Bassett third team. But for a period we played together. But, but he got back from his first England cap, this guy John Webb, and his father, who was a missionary doctor, said to him, John, I couldn't be more proud of you. Now I want you to go and read the Bible with Rico. That's what his father said. That's the background. That's what you need, isn't it? That's a praying dad who said, John, I'm thrilled you're a doctor. I'm thrilled you played for England. Will you please read the Bible with Rico? <laughs> now, if you've got that sort of support, you can get people moving. But it's much harder now. We ain't got the same parents that we had then. So as we go forward, as we're, as we're here, what, are these, what have we got here in terms of these benefits? What do you think they are? What have I got? Let's have a look down. So understanding. What, 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 what's the benefit of understanding with someone who you read one-to-one -one with? Shout out. You know the person better. Exactly. You, you, it's individual. You can look into their eyes. And as you, as you work with them, jot these three E's down. There are three E's that are the code of meeting with them. Here are the three E's, brothers and sisters. Explore, explain, encourage. So number one, listen, listen, listen. What are they saying individually? Explore. Secondly, explain. What's the next thing to teach them? Thirdly, encourage from your own life. How does that work out? You know, those three E's. Explore. What are they saying? What have they just said? Explain, encourage. I took a funeral at All Souls, and it was of an old guy in the congregation, his son, had been working at All Souls in our music department for 20 years. When I went to go through the funeral with the son, so he'd, you know, he was a volunteer, but had been very faithful at All Souls, I realised he was basically unconverted. At All Souls, listening to John Stott and others for 20 years, because no one had done any individual stuff. It was just amazing. As I sat down and we prepared the service, I thought, this man isn't really a Christian. We'd, we'd never done that. We'd never sat with him individually. He'd sat corporately, but you've got to have an individual chat. So number one, and what's the key thing on understanding? Brothers and sisters, here's the key to all personal work. Have, jot it down. Have they understood grace? Have they got, you know, if we get grace, we win in the Christian life, and if you don't, you lose. Isn't that right? C.S. Lewis was asked, what's unique about the Christian faith? He said, grace. So number one, what about application? What do you think application What's so great about that meeting one-to-one -one with somebody? What's the application thing? How does that work? Absolutely. You, you're, you're, able to, you're able to just say, well, how would this apply to this situation? Because you know them. Uh, you know, it's amazing. I'm reading the Bible at the moment with a guy who's a barrister. It's quite interesting. His wife is so cross about him looking at the Christian faith. We do it during the day when he's meant to be at work. But I mean, you know, but I mean, you just individually try and apply the thing. Gosh, I hope I better get that cut off the tape so that doesn't go out. But I'm, what I'm saying is, is, that, is, that, is that, you know, uh, uh, we've we just got to make sure that we actually individually do that. Thirdly, what about example? What about example? 
What's key on example? What do they, what do they get as they're meeting one-to-one -one with you? They see your life. By the way, the good bits and the bad bits, but they see it. Here's something to jot down. We mustn't just invite people to church, but our lives as well. At, at All Souls, my church, we do invite people to church. Do they come into my life? Do they see it? 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, we loved you so much we shared with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. I remember reading the Bible with a Hindu guy, and he said to me, because he'd come home, and I'd try and clear up the kitchen, and then we'd look at the Bible, and we'd chat as I was clearing up the kitchen. And he'd say to me, Rico, in my culture, the men don't clear up the kitchen. It's interesting to watch you do it. You do it very badly, but at least you're trying. <laughs> but there, there's that sh life sharing. Third, number four, what about confidentiality? Why is that so important, confidentiality? Trust, Trust and it's a, to jot this down, everyone, it's a safe place. You say to them, no one else, well, you know, this isn't going to go out. This is between us. It's safe. I'm, gonna, you know, we're not, I'm not going to say what you've been saying to me and I've been saying to you. It's a safe place, which is, again, why I've got to get that, that thing pulled off from earlier. But anyway, um, training. Why, what's big on training? What's big on training? Training is what's their next step? What's the next thing they're going to do? So as you meet with them, you're going, now there are two steps, there are, do jot this down, there are always two steps for people. How can they, what do they need to learn and how can they serve? So you're always, in the Christian life, we're always going, how to learn, how to serve. So you go, come to Keswick, you're going to learn, then when you get back, serve. This is a massive learning place, isn't it? But it's always learning and serving. Ephesians 4 has got that in there, we're always to be learning and serving. So, so what's their next step? And just to say at the moment, you know, the people I'm seeing come to faith have someone tracking them. Uh, let me read you what John Stott wrote about the man who led him to faith. Here we go. I thank God for the man who led me to Christ and for the extraordinary devotion with which he nurtured me in the early years of my Christian life. He wrote to me every week for, I think, seven years. He also prayed for me every day. I believe he still does. I can only begin to guess what I owe under God to such a faithful friend and pastor. So that's John Stott's first commentary, Guard the Gospel to Timothy. And there was someone who was on that. Now let me tell you what happened at All Souls again. About 10 years ago, there was a lovely girl called Anna who was uh, coming with her daughter, uh, Annalise, to be baptised. And she'd met her husband, Graham, on Christianity Explored and their little girl was getting baptised, I was doing the baptism, and I thought, this is an absolute model of the structures I've set up at All Souls. We had Christianity explored, we had discipleship explored, it was all in order, I thought, this is just going to be great. So I was interviewing her uh, at the baptism, and I said, so Anna, how have you come to faith? And she said, to my great horror, she said, it's all because of Judy I met on a coach eight years ago, and I looked across, and there was Judy, and I sort of, uh, and, and she said, um, Judy's a pastor's wife, but she's going to become a godmother today in, in the Midlands. We met on a coach, and she got me on Christianity Explored. After I did that, she made me do it again. Then she got me on, on Discipleship Explored. Uh, then she uh, made sure I did a springboard course. Then I came back and led on Christianity Explored, which she suggested, and I met Graham. We've got married and had a child. Do you know, I thought it was all me, <laughs> and it wasn't. It was all Judy. So you've got to have someone tracking and by the way, brothers and sisters, it's exhausting. It's, abs it's exhausting, but we've got to do this individual stuff. So, so that's the next one, uh, training. What's their next step in learning and serving? And then as we go on, what about flexibility? What's amazing on flexibility? What's amazing on that? What's amazing on flexibility? Yeah, well, but also flexibility is when are they available? When's it, when's it great for them? What, you know, just let's just be flexible with them. Let's make sure that we, you know, okay, if they go, look, I can't meet until 9.30 at night, we can meet on the phone, we can do a Zoom, we, but we can meet around their diary. They're not Christian, we can't expect them to fit in with ours. And that's the great thing, the flexibility. Great, everyone. So, so uh, 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 on we go uh, with that. I just wanted to get that in place. So let's just move on to our next thing, and, and, and as we move on now. What do I then need? Do jot that down. It's at the bottom there. A friend, a heart, a passage, a venue, an aim. Just as we've got that there. So I need a friend. I need a heart. I need a passage. I need a place. I need a name. You know, who am I going to? Who, who am I going to go with? How's that going to happen? What's a little passage I can get open? Maybe John one. Where's a place we can meet? Or props on the phone. 
What's the aim? Well, to preach Christ. I just want them to grow in Christ and to learn of Jesus. That's what I've got to do there. Great, and you've got that word one-to-one there. Now, just before we move forward, let me just give you another. We've looked at power. It's in the word. Let me just do one other passage, sovereignty. So just as we come down, uh, as we do... Brother, let's stop now. No more. Okay. Um, let's go to Acts, Acts, Acts chapter 17. Acts 17. And and can we come to an absolute key passage here? Acts 17, verses 24 to 28. Let's look at this together. Acts 17, 24 to 28. Okay. So I wonder if you can see that. So so again, we're doing confidence. And when it comes to -to one-to-one work, I found this is the most important passage to get in place in terms of people starting to do that on their street and with other people and indeed doing their evangelism. Let's have a look. Can you just look down at verses 24 to 28? Have a look down. And as you go through these these verses, 24 to 28, can you please tell me who God is? So just in pairs, have a quick look. Who is God in 24? Who is he in 25? Who is he in 26? And then we'll see the application of it. But have a look down. I think this is, this, 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 if people get that, can I just say again, it transforms, jot this down, their energy and optimism. Let's move forward in a moment, but let's get this in place now. Now hold on to your seats. Have a look at it together. 24 to 28, it transforms their energy and optimism as we come to it. One more minute, everyone. One more minute. Who is God? Well, we'll get there in a moment. Just, just, yeah, just, just each verse is about who is God, yeah. Okay, now this is, this is an incredibly important passage to teach on evangelism. Again, we're going back to the word confidence. So who is God? We've had it in verse 24. How is God described in verse 24? The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not live in temples built by human hands. Who is that God? Who is he? He's the creator. So everything is made by him. The God who made the world and everything in it. So Your neighbour is made by God. Your relation, who's an atheist, is made by God. We have to get that presupposition of creation in place for our evangelism. Again, we picked it up yesterday when we saw that Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me, Matthew 28. 
and we saw that he's the author and he has authority. So number one, he's the creator. Who is God? How is God described in verse 25? And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. He is the sustainer, exactly. So not only are they made by God, <gasps> they breathe because God gives them breath. Do you know, in Keswick today, I mean, and the town's delightful, but there'll be many people who are a number of people who are atheist. They'll look at those hills. They'll enjoy walking up them today. They'll breathe the air. It's all because God gives them breath and, he, and they don't even acknowledge his existence. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, Lord, please have mercy. But, but, but we breathe and we'll breathe for as long as God gives us breath. We are sustained by him and everyone is. Who is God in verse 26? From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lives. 24, he's creator. 25, he's sustainer. Who is he in verse 26? He is the history maker, yes. What else have we got there? If he's the one who marks out their appointed times and the boundaries of their lands... He is the sovereign king. The, the word, he's the ruler. God rules, and now hold on to your seats, everyone here. He decides where you live and how long you live. So wherever you're living, I know you've made the choice to live there, but God has, that doesn't stop God being God. He's decided you live there. And furthermore, now this is the key thing we often don't get. He has decided who lives next door to you. He's not just decided you live there, but my neighbours, uh, uh, John and Sarah, he's decided they live there. Now, they think they're in London to work for BP. They're not. Why are they in London, according to the sustainer, creator, and ruler? Have a look down at the next verse. God did this so that people would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. They are there to meet Jesus. That's what's going on in history. God's intention for history is that people meet Jesus. That's what's going on. So I know that the Christian faith in this country is being given a status in a court, in, you know, uh, uh, aligned with croquet. It's seen as totally irrelevant. Brothers and sisters, no. God decides who lives, where they live, and how long they live for. So every neighbour you have or if you're coming up on the train and you've sat next to someone, everything you do is a divine appointment. God puts the people next to you. When I walk down the street and I see my neighbour, I know God has decided I meet them and bump into them at that moment. Now, by the way, you then say to me, what does this do about human free will? Because there are these people, these atheists, they're just doing what they like. Let's look back to Acts chapter 4, please. We've got to get this in place. Back to Acts 4. Keep a finger there and back to Acts 4. This is so important, this understanding of sovereignty for our confidence in evangelism. Acts chapter 4. Now hold on to your seats and see what happens in verses 27 to 29. So here is, here is uh, the believers' prayer meeting. And as they pray, they explain the situation of the crucifixion. Verse 27 of Acts 4. Brothers and sisters, hold on to your seats because this will blow your heads off. Okay, are you ready? Indeed, Herod Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles, the people of Israel in this city, to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. And then, so, so this is how Jesus got killed. There was the sin of Herod, the sin of Pilate, the sin of the Roman centurion, the sin of the Roman soldiers, the sin of the people. All those things were happening. The Gentiles, Pontius Pilate, they all got together and, 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 and they came to kill Jesus. Now verse 28, do you see what it says? They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. So please write this down. Are you ready for this? First, on 28, here's what you, you've got to say. You have to be very, very powerful to have your enemies do your bidding while acting against you. But that is how the Bible tells us to speak about God. Those people, you have to be very, very powerful to have your enemies do your bidding while acting against you. But that's how we're meant to think of the sovereign God. So, it doesn't mean 
that Pilate and the chief priests and the people and the Roman soldiers are not responsible for what they did. They are, and they made their own free choices. But that doesn't stop God being God. You have to be very, very powerful to have your enemies do your bidding while acting against you. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. So what does this mean for your neighbor? They're living there. They're totally godless. They think they're conducting their life. But God has put them there, and even more than that, he decides that you meet them when you're walking along the road. Everything is a divine appointment. You can't stop God being God. So what happens is, when it comes to evangelism, all I'm doing is saying, I'm aligning my life with the will of creator, sustainer, and ruler of the universe. Now, if you believe that, it it, it means you explode with confidence. It means as I sit down to have my hair cut yesterday and I'm talking to the Turkish uh, barber and uh, he says to me, what are you here for? I say, I'm here for a Christian convention and we're off. Why is that? Because God has decided that I'm there speaking to him. So I'm not the one who takes the initiative in evangelism. It's the Lord. It's the Lord. And I did history at university. I never did proper history. This is proper history. This is the real history of the world. Now, can I say, if you believe that, so when a new neighbour arrives on my street, the Walden Street in London, I meet them, I say, oh, they, they move into number 12. What I do is I take round the bin liners. I, t- I say, recycling's on a, on, a, on, a, on a Thursday. I normally take round a box of chocolates. I say, welcome, we're at number 12. In London, it's so lonely, people love if you've knocked on the door. And then we go from there. But why do I do it? I know because God has put them there with me. So I scuttle back and write their names down. If you get this passage... It transforms your confidence. Whoever you're with, God has organized it. You're at the five-a-side soccer on a Saturday morning. You're standing next to a person. God's put them there. So you just start to chat. Now, as you chat, um, uh, uh, anyway, we'll we'll, we'll come back. We'll pick that up uh, in a moment. But let's keep going now. Okay, what I want to do now is saying, okay, even though that's true, here's the next thing. What is it that stops us? Can we stick on the next? I'm not getting... Oh, there we are. What's it that stops us doing evangelism? I wonder if you can do... So that's, you know, God has put us here, and yet we don't do it. Why don't we do it? Over to you in a couple of minutes. Just let's discuss that. So in our churches, why don't we personally or corporately do this evangelism? Let's do that for a couple of minutes, because if these things are true, we've got the power, God is sovereign, the world's about Jesus, why still don't we do it? Over to you. Let's just discuss that. It's a great question for, for, for working out what stops us doing it. What stops us doing evangelism? Could you make sure everyone gets a new... This is the next handout. Could, it, could, could everyone get them? I don't know if someone else can do them too. That's great. I'll take one. Perfect. Thanks, Bray. If they could all go. Great, everyone. Now, now just remember, so we've got that second flyer there. Um, when I'm ever trying to do any talks on evangelism, I didn't do it here at Keswick because the fact you've come means you're motivated. I always begin with this question. 
always begin with what stops us doing it. Otherwise, you're not going to connect with people because there might be people sitting there and they've just decided, I'm, not just, I'm just not doing it. So I begin with that. And don't forget, explore, explain, encourage. So what have they said? Listen, listen, listen. Now just shout out personally and corporately, what is it that stops us doing it? Why don't we do it? So, a lack of passion. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, and, and we'll look at a moment what the motivation could be. When, when we talk about a lack of passion, what do you think, what does that entail, do you think? I, I think a lack of passion will be that other things we've given our hearts to. So idols. The, I, when I, I wrote this little book, um, Honest Evangelism, which is, um, uh, um, uh, a, book about, a book about evangelism, and by far the most feedback I got from it, I was saying, you know, why don't we do it, was, the, was chapter three on idolatry. We're, it's because our hearts are given to other things. So, so what are our daydreams, what are our nightmares? There are other things that we're, we're living for, not, not, not Christ. And time and again, that if someone is, is not doing evangelism, where's their heart? Where's their heart? That's the key issue. And um, I found chapter three of this book. By the way, I wrote, it's funny, this book, Honest Evangelism. Um, I was meant to write it during my sabbatical in 2014, but the World Cup was on. So I watched the World Cup football instead, which was pretty hopeless. And then over half term, my wife and I had to, to write it. I've got dyslexia. She's very, she did an English degree, so she basically wrote it for me over six days with her parents babysitting. And there we were doing it. And after six days, I said to her, darling, isn't this lovely? Here we are, working together for the gospel, writing this book. And she looked at me and she said, I hate you and I hate this book. So I dedicated it to her. And um, uh, so there, there it is. But, but um, it, it's dedicated to her. So do get a copy. Anyway, what else stops us doing evangelism? Lack of passion, and that can be idolatry. What are the other things that stop us? Fear of failure, fear. But brothers, sisters, whenever you start on evangelism, you've got to tackle the word fear. And then you've got to say to people, you are going to get rejected. You are going to get rejected. Jesus promised we'd get rejected. Doesn't matter how charming you are. And, uh, and so he says, Matthew 10, verse 17, I send you out as sheep among wolves. Now, a lot of evangelism training isn't honest with people. The reason I called the book Honest Evangelism was that we're not being honest about what the gospel is and also with Christians about the fact this is tough. You're going to get rejected. There's also going to be amazing as some people come to faith. But here's the key word. Write this down. I've therefore got to have my identity in the grace of God. So that please jot this phrase down. Whether you accept or reject me doesn't make me more valuable. What makes me valuable is Christ died for me. I've got to get grace in place because I'm going to get rejected. And then what I need is resilience, okay? Resilience means having a tough skin and a soft heart. I've got to, have, I've got to say, Lord, give me resilience. A soft heart, like Jesus, who as he goes to Calvary, as he goes to die, says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. That's a soft heart, but a tough skin. Nothing was going to stop him dying for us. What else? What else? And anything else that stops us? Yeah, I don't know what to say. So, so a bit of training. I've got to know what to say. What do I say? And by the way, I've got a little six-box outline here that do take afterwards to take away that's a great little outline called Two Ways to Live. So this is for you to take and have a look at. We might do a little outline of it afterwards. We haven't got time now. Okay, so that's what stops me. When I'm then trying to work on people, can you get the bit of paper I've got there? And uh, if we can turn, please, to um, uh, Rome, that Romans one on the... Do you see it sitting there? And here are four G's I'm looking to get in place when I'm looking to, to really communicate the gospel to people. Four things I'm really trying to get in place. And, and the key here word, the key word is in their identity. I'm really trying to get people to have this in the middle of their hearts because then they'll have passion. So number one, the first thing to get in place when it comes to, 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 to getting people to do evangelism is grace. And what I'm not going to do is say, do evangelism, do evangelism, do evangelism. I'm going to say, Titus 1 verse 1 for your notes, the knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. If they understand these things, they'll want to communicate. If I understand, my goodness me, God's put me next door to the, the two people next door to me. I'm a student, and the two guys next door to me in P1.4 and P1.6, because I was in P1.5, have been put there by God. It transforms my, my attitude. So the knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. Let's get four things in place. First of all, grace. 
What, what is it about grace? And do you see Romans 1 and verses 16 and 17? I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew, then the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So have I got grace in place? That means in my morning quiet time, I'm going, okay, here's my sin. Oh, I can't believe it. Here's God's grace. Then there's joy. Then there's discipleship and evangelism. But I mustn't try and go into the day going evangelism, discipleship. I've got to start with sin, grace, joy as I see my sin. Now, what is, what is the gospel? It's a declaration of righteousness. God says, knowing all about my sin... Rico is absolutely righteous before God. Why? Because I am given the performance of Jesus and I relate to God amazingly, not through my performance, but through Christ's. So just this extraordinary thing, how is it that I'm accepted? Because I'm simul yestus at Bacator, I'm at the same time a sinner and justified. So here's the story that Luther told, I'll make it modern. Imagine in 2010... Imagine that Prince William one, one morning comes out of St. James's Palace with a baseball cap on, cap on on a Saturday morning. People can't see who he is. He walks up Haymarket. He gets up Haymarket. He turns right into Shaftesbury Avenue and left into Soho. He goes into Soho and there is a prostitute there. And she's got needle marks up and down her arms. Her language is disgusting. Uh, there's a smell of alcohol. There are clients who've used her. And imagine Prince William walks up to her takes her by the hand, and much to the amazement of the world and the chagrin of Kate Middleton, he takes her by the hand and he says, will you come with me right now to Westminster Abbey? We're going to get married. And he takes her to Westminster Abbey. He gives her a white dress. She's just staggered. He says, I'm marrying you. And then he says, I want you to come back now with me and be my bride and my wife forever. And that's what's happened to us in the gospel. We have been justified We've been sanctified, we are being sanctified and adopted. And we are like that prostitute. And Jesus is like William. And if you understand that, it becomes overwhelming. So there is a declaration, and therefore in my life, I don't live for your approval, but from it. I live from that approval. And I'm longing for that grace to be in me, but also for my loved ones to know it. Secondly, it's not just the grace of God. Secondly, Gehenna. Can we look down again at our piece of paper here? And chapter, verse four, 14, I'm a debtor both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and foolish. So Paul said, I have a debt about the gospel. So here I am, and uh, is there a John here? Any, anyone called John here? There's a John, there's a John there. And uh, what's your wife called, sir, or the lady next to you? Anne. So here are John and Anne. Okay, say that I give John five pounds, and he gives it back to me. So he's then in my debt, he gives it back to me. But say we do it this way. Say I give John five pounds and I say, John, can you pass it on to Anne? Now until John passes the five pounds on to Anne, he's in my debt and he's in Anne's debt. That's the debt there of Romans 1.14. It's a pass it on debt. And the gospel tells us that sin is so serious Jesus had to die. That's how serious it is. And we are in debt until we pass it on. Those neighbours on our street that God's put us next to, I'm in their debt until I've passed it on, until I've said, look, you know, have you, have, what do you do at Christmas? Would you like to come and celebrate it? Until I've tried to say something. And so, so just to say how serious this debt is, can you please turn inside and see what Jesus said about hell? This is how serious the debt is. Because sin, if it's not paid for, means I pay for myself in a place called hell. Now, if you don't believe the words of Jesus, that's fine. But if you do, and I come from a non-Christian family, so the people I've buried, I don't think I'll see again. They're in God's hands, but I don't think I'll see them again. If you, brother, sister, if you come from, I I mean, if this is true, how can I not pass on? How can I not actually just, just make it clear that, you know, that... We've, we've, we've got to pass this on. I, I mean, I'm, I owe it. Let's just see what Jesus says. Do you see what he says? Matthew 5, 22. Last line. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of the hell. Sermon on the Mount. 5, 29, 30. 
If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than the whole of your body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it out, throw it away, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and may enter through it. Uh, last three lines of chapter eight of, 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 uh, of Matthew 8. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 10, 26 to 28. When I tell you what I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight, what is whispered in the ear, proclaim from the roofs. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body and can't kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Three questions about hell. Please jot them down. One, does hell exist? Answer, yes, Jesus says so. If we can't believe Jesus on hell, we can't believe him on anything. There's only one Jesus. Do you saw, These were his words. He's the theologian of hell. Brothers and sisters, he speaks of it again and again. Secondly, what is hell like? Answer, it's a place of separation, suffering, and punishment, where you pay for your sin yourself. There is a place called hell. Sin is so serious, Jesus had to die. But what is hell like? It's a place of punishment and separation. Thirdly, who goes there? Can we see Matthew 5, 29, 30? It's better for you to lose one part of your body and throw it into hell. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to lose one part of your body and be thrown into hell. People who say, I can do what I like with the eyes God gave me, the hands God gave me, and the feet God gave me. Those are the people who go to hell. The people who say, I do what I like. I will decide what I do. And the only way to be saved from hell is through the cross. So we're to be saved from hell through the cross for heaven. Two statements on this as we move on. Statement number one. I live my life around a mission statement. Here is my mission statement. I organize my time around this mission statement. And I'd ask you to do this too. Here it is. I got it off Bishop Frank Retief, who's an Anglican bishop in Cape Town. The bishop there said, please organize your diary, Rico, around this mission statement. Here it is, that people without Christ go to hell. So let's just, I just, I organize my life around that. People without Christ go to hell. I've had members of my family who have gone to hell. I'd have no, I have, I mean, they're in God's hands, but I have no hope of seeing them because they believe totally in their own goodness. They said, I don't need Jesus to die for me. They said, um, uh, because I'm good, God looks at me. So I don't think I'll see them again. So we have to organize it. And the second question is this, and this is a hard question, brothers and sisters. Here's the second question. Do your non-Christian friends and neighbors know that you think this is where they'll go? Do they, do they know that that's what you think, that there's a place called hell and that they'll go there? Now, before I say that to anyone, I say, look, this relationship is so precious. I'm really worried about saying that. But I have to tell you that I think that at the end of our lives, God will ask us two questions. Do you know me and have you had your sin forgiven? I think he'll ask you that. And I think if the answer to that is negative, he'll confirm your decision and decide to send you to a place of separation. The Bible calls it hell. Now, can I say it? I say, look, I'm, so I always, before I say that, I always make sure that I've said this is a precious relationship. But do the people around you know that's what you think? Or do we care more of what they think of me now than of what God will think of them on Judgment Day? <laughs> that's the issue. You know, on Judgment Day, they're going to say, you live next door to me. You never said it. When I was playing rugby at Oxford University and getting my third, when I got my third, I said to my tutor, was I close to a 2-2? He said, no, he cared. it was a very solid third. So I knew that ordination was the only career option available. <laughs> but um, I played rugby for the university and I played with a guy called, called Ed and I gave him a, a sermon I preached. I was at Theological College on Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And one night, Ed played it the night before a game to a rugby house and Dave was there who was captain of the Blues. And Dave heard my talk in which I said, either we pay for our sin ourselves in hell or the Lamb of God pays. And he got more and more angry. And at the end of it, he said, Rico's not my friend. And they said, don't be stupid. Of course he's your friend. He said, no, he's not. If that's what Rico believes, the fact he said nothing to me in 18 months means he doesn't care for me. Non-Christian. He said, if he cares, he'd have told me. 
But the trouble is, you see, we go, my faith is a personal, private thing. It helps me in my life. I wouldn't dream of, 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 I wouldn't dream of, of, of um, thrusting it down anyone's throat. We're being gracious. We say, look, this is so... But I, and now, jot down those two questions. God, I think God's going to ask, do you know me? Have you had your sin forgiven? What do you, can we talk about those questions? I think he's going to ask it. Now, thirdly, what stops us speaking? If you believe this, what stops us speaking? And we've had it already, idolatry, glory. Do you see as we look down, verse 25, glory, they exchanged the truth about God for a lion, worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who's ever praised. We worship and serve other things, even though we're Christian. And those other things dominate our hearts, and we think I'm not risking them by speaking to people. And so our faith isn't in God, our faith's in our agenda for God. That's why we don't speak about Jesus. I was at the back of All Souls one day and a woman came running out of church and she ran up to me, I just preached, and she said, tell my daughter, tell my daughter to apply for Oxford University. And I looked at her and the daughter came out and we looked at each other, we had a look, which was your mum's a nutter, we had that exchange of look. <laughs> and, and, and the daughter said, I want to go to UCL, it's a university in London. What had that mother been praying about for the previous hour in church? What has she been praying about? Daughter going to Oxford. Is that a good thing? Yes. What did it become? A God thing. Good things become God things, and that's why we don't speak. And so, brothers and sisters, what are your daydreams? What are your idols? You've got to dig them out. The thing about idols is we love them, we trust them, we obey them. We love, trust, and obey them. And uh, again, chapter three of the book I've done is huge on that. But we've got to work out, why am I not speaking? Why are others not speaking? What idols are we serving? That's why the first two commandments are about idolatry. Okay, so, so and then lastly, godliness, godliness. Now this is very important. You cannot be godly, you cannot be godly and not be concerned for the lost. God was so concerned for the lost, he sent his son to die. Now everyone, what's happened in our churches is this. We have somehow removed godliness from evangelism. So we've got all these people who think they're being godly, but they've decided they never talk to people about faith. Now, if you want to be like God, God so loved the world, he sent his son. So at the heart of being godly is telling people, and yet we've got this view that actually, I don't have to tell people. <laughs> we have. It's just a nightmare. That's what's going on. So we've got to reinterpret godliness. And it's not, oh, my faith is a personal, private thing. It helps me in my life. I wouldn't dream of, in, of, 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 of um, imposing it on other people. Okay, everyone, let's finish there. Of those four Gs, of those four Gs, which one is your weakest? Have you got grace in your identity? So whether someone accepts or rejects you doesn't make you valuable. What makes you valuable is Christ died for you. Have you got Gehenna in place? Maybe to read through those verses on hell. And does your neighbour know you think that? These people you've known, do they know that it's not just a hobby, you think it's this serious? COVID now enables us to talk about hope. Pray I'll do it. I've told you, do my neighbours know? Thirdly, glory. What idols? You see, the, what other glories am I got my heart involved in? And fourthly, Godliness. Okay, what, have I suddenly got a view of, of, of being like Jesus that excludes telling others about Jesus? Let's pray as we close. Let's pray together. Oh, Jesus, thank you that you die so we can be forgiven. As we think of the fact that we haven't been speaking to others, thank you so much we're forgiven. Our cowardice and our idolatry Thank you that we're forgiven our unbelief in a place like hell. Oh, thank you so much. So we just ask for your cleansing and forgiveness once again, and we live by your performance, not our own. It's so good to be forgiven. And now, Lord, may the knowledge of the truth lead to godliness. Help us, Lord, to be looking to tell others. And just in a moment now, who's the spirit bringing to mind for you to be telling? Just a moment to raise that person up. Oh, Lord, please, open their blind eyes. Tell them who Jesus is, we pray. 
May, may, I, may they be spiritually hungry. Amen. Amen. And, and just have a look here as we close. What are the great truths then that we build our church evangelism around? Just as we close. Here I am. I'm about to jump off into evangelism. What are the great truths that hold me? Have I got these through? Power. We preach Christ. God opens blind eyes. Sovereignty. Acts 17. That's 2 Corinthians 4 verses 1 to 6. Sovereignty. Have we got that? Acts 17 verses 24 to 28. Um, God has placed me, he is the evangelist, and every opportunity, everyone I meet is a divine opportunity. And thirdly, grace. My identity is in the grace of God, so whether they accept or reject me, I'm held. And then as I jump off and I do it, I'm utterly secure. Great, everybody. Thanks for coming. If you want an outline of Christian faith to teach others, I've got one here, and I might do a little outline of it over there afterwards, but um, do, do grab one of these. And on, th- on Thursday morning, 9.30, we're looking at living out this. What does it mean to be a faithful leader in terms of living out and authentically um, living for Christ? Great. Great to have you, and do grab one of these if you want one. And stay there all my earthly days Rejoicing in your love until I join with heaven's eternal praise Take me to that ancient hill Stay there all my earthly days Rejoicing in your love until I join with hands eternal Son eternally 
Thank you. 